the science. The fight is that the blood of a thousand men and women was filled in these laws. Limbs twisted and broken. Eyes gouged from bloody pockets. Fresh burned black. Well, how's the weather out there? <laughs> Sorry. Cold. Huh? Very cold. Very cold, yeah. Very cold. <laughs> okay, we're, we're, we're up now. <laughs> okay. Sorry about Sorry that. About that. I mean, we, we, we have problems every now and then. It seems every time we talk about Mothman or um, any kind of other creature like that, we I don't know, it's the strangest thing. It, really it is, is kind of weird because uh, it, it, it definitely it just, is related. Things happen. I certain don't. subject matter. And we haven't even really got into Mothman yet. I, I know. <laughs> you just started by saying you went to straight back from Point Pleasant. Yes. Yeah. That was a that was a very small town. You know, I checked into the hotel there, and um, the I went on the corner. Yeah, I went to the low, and I yeah, got the there. Hall, right. Yeah, I got there at three forty-five in the morning, and it's a mom and pop joint, and. Um, that guy was not very, very happy that I disturbed him out of his sleep at uh, 3 in the morning. <laughs> I no. will tell you that. Uh, I didn't realize it was such a small town, but, I mean, we, we, we have there, and um, we, we got there, and it was silent. I mean, middle of downtown Point Pleasant, a little after 3 in the morning, and it was dead silent. Oh, when I was there in 2001, 2002, before the movie had opened, um, the whole downtown was essentially a ghost town. There was a, a restaurant, the low was there, but there was storefront after storefront that were completely empty. And I was talking to the people at the low and the mayor and the Chamber of Commerce people because they were all so approachable. And I said, you know, you really should get a museum going. You really should get some kind of festival going because you've got an opportunity to be the new Roswell. and. Uh, and they just looked at me and they said, well, all of our young people are moving away. And, you know, I don't know if this movie will be that successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah. Understatement. Well, now, now they have an annual festival. Now they have a statue in the middle of town. And, and they have a nice museum. And, uh, you know, local industries picking up. They, they even have a tour, I guess, of uh, the TNT, the Moss Mine sites. And, huh. I didn't and, see that. Uh, you know, they, the Chamber of Commerce is printing maps up, and you can go see where Mothman was seen and different things like that. And when I was there, the only thing they were trying to, they tried around Christmas of 2001 to, to, pr to make up some ornaments uh, with the Mothman on it and a little, <laughs> a little beanie doll, and that was about it. But they hadn't really thought about T-shirts or or anything with regard to what you know you usually see in a, a tourist location uh, i haven't been there again like i said but I, i'm pretty sure i've seen some things that are trying to get a little bit more acknowledgement going of the the history of the area now connected with mothman oh well let's uh let's jump back on the um the sasquatch bigfoot thing um, let's go with sasquatch actually uh, okay <clears throat> i um I was doing a little, a little bit of research, and for the longest time, I, I thought that Sasquatch was a, a, a Native American term for the Bigfoot, and I, and I heard, or I read, actually, that it was an amalgamation of a number of Native American words describing this creature. Um, somebody by the name Burns, uh, is, that, is that information correct? Yeah, in, uh, in the 1920s, J.W. Burns, who was... Uh both an Indian trader sort of uh, teacher as well as a newspaper man slash magazine article writer decided to come up with a, a coined word and he took various names for the these Bigfoot type creatures 
from the, the native peoples of Canada, and he came up with the word Sasquatch. Uh, now, if you look back at the old records uh, of uh, before 1920, when he really coined the word, most of the time, from 1920s uh, onward through 1958, the Sasquatch was really seen as a, a gigantic race of, of more primitive Indians. And that's what most people, most native Canadians and, uh, and newspaper people up there oftentimes would talk about it. Slowly uh, towards the 50s, we started getting much more, uh, more ape-like, gorilla-like reports of, uh, of the Sasquatch from British Columbia. And then in, of course, uh, the 1950s, 58, you started having the big throw from California, and the, and the two traditions kind of merged uh, when John Green started going down from uh, British Columbia and reporting on the Bigfoot from California. But, uh, you know, I've had, I have, for instance, in my museum, a little doll that they used to uh, sell in, you know, native trading, Indian trading centers and different things like that. And it looks very much like a hairy doll with long hair. Uh, and down at the bottom, you can see Sasquatch. And in many <laughs> ways, the face looks like a Native American. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, you get some confusion there about what, were they talking about humans that were just bigger, that were hairy? that had long, long hair that would come down to the waist? Uh, were they a, another more primitive tribe of, of Indians that were there first? So it, it becomes very confusing. And in fact, if you look at back into old, old records in North America, you'll come across the use of the word wild man and wild people quite often, uh, almost as if they're trying really to explain uh, this, this creature's in mundane, more human consciousness so that they can kind of put them someplace in their cosmos because I don't think they were really, really uh, able to acknowledge that there was a parallel uh, race of, of beings that were not human but were more ape-like. Hmm. Um, for those of you who just uh, tuned in and you want to talk to uh, Mr. Coleman about cryptozoology and Bigfoot here are the numbers it's um, our 1-800-960-2289 or if you're in the local area you can call 336-996-1596 those numbers again are 1-800-960-2289 or 336-996-1596 or jump in the chat room make up a name and um, ask the question there yeah, you can reach us in our chat room at worldoftheunexplained.com and uh, just hit chat and uh, come on in or omnisoundradio1.net. So, um, do you think, uh, Lauren, do you think that, that these Bigfoot creatures, I mean, we're still getting sightings reported now on a daily basis. Is, is, that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that uh, pretty frequently I'd say that certainly, you know, in one week's time, there's probably one case uh, someplace in North America that's, you know, one sighting that's pretty good. But most people, um, the media doesn't report on them the way they used to. Uh, most people <clears throat> are pretty, uh, you know, the ridicule factor is certainly there, and they're pretty cautious about talking about them. So uh, even though the sightings are still going on, it's, uh, it's quite infrequent that you hear about them. Indeed, uh, most of the reports that we're hearing about "Quote unquote," a Bigfoot are coming out of Malaysia, and you you can see two or three articles a week on the Malaysian Bigfoot since really it's been a nonstop since December of last year. Well, that's very interesting too, since they made that recent discovery of uh, the many people that they found on the island of Flores uh, down there in the um, Indonesian chains of islands, and um, it seems like a really opportune place for a, a, a rather large creature to uh, to roam. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, the Flores people, the little hobbits, as the media likes to call them, certainly has confirmed for us what we've known for years, that there are little people reports, uh, little hairy people. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm oftentimes asked, well, where are the bones? Where are the bones? Well, we found the bones. I mean, we've 
we certainly know now that there were nine individuals of, uh, that have been found. And this is an individual creature that was three feet tall, you know, full-grown adults that were three feet tall, probably covered in hair. Uh, and certainly the local people have talked about as recently as 100 years ago, knowing that these little people are, were around. And uh, you get reports of these from uh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, all the way over through Indonesia, and even some reports from Hawaii of the Minahuni, which are the little hairy people over there. Mm -hmm. So there may have been a whole uh, you know, race of individuals, of little people that existed in uh, the Oceania area uh, that just uh, recently died out, or, or maybe there's still some pockets of them living. Very possible. Um, and I guess that's a, <clears throat> going back to North America, for a little bit is um, basically one of the things, one of the problems that skeptics may have with cryptozoology and, and mysterious creatures, especially one of such magnitude like, like the Bigfoot, like the Loch Ness monster, um, is very much well. If these are animals, then they die, and they leave remains. So basically, where are the remains? You know, and, and that seems to be one of the. Uh, one of the big arguments against it. What, what's your answer to that? Well, well first of all, if, if it's a sea monster or a lake monster like Loch Ness, then the body's certainly harder to find because they, they go to the bottom of the, the lake or the ocean. Uh, but in terms of uh, this question I'm asked all the time, you know, where is the body of Bigfoot? If they, if they exist, they die, where's the body? And uh, that's an easy one for me to answer because I've been all across the United States and Canada and I've asked wildlife biologists all over, uh, you know, where, when or where have you ever found the body of a mountain lion? Where and when have you ever found the body of a, a bear in the woods? And the universal answer is that people don't find, you know, even wildlife biologists don't find dead bear, don't find dead puma. I uh, don't find dead animals in the woods. Why is that? It's because animals tend, these large, smart animals, tend to hide themselves as and, they're dying. Okay, Lauren, we, we got a, we got got a caller. caller here. Hang on okay. just a second. Let me plug him through. Hello, oh. caller. You're on the air. Can you tell us what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is John calling from Messina, New York. Hey, John. Hey, John. How are you tonight? Oh, good. fantastic. Hope you're doing yeah, good. good. Yeah, I got a few questions. I'm curious, uh, how long has uh, cryptozoology, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, been around in the world? Well, cryptozoology has been around for a long time. It used to be called romantic zoology. Uh, if you look at the beginnings of zoology, cryptozoology was there when, because it was the way that scientists and zoologists would find new animals. They would talk to local native peoples, they would animal collect, and they would bring back new species. Romantic zoology, uh, as the precursor of zoology, really has still uh, was around in the 18th century as a way to find new animals, like the, the gorilla or the okapi or the giant panda. Uh, Ivan Sanderson in 1940s uh, coined the word cryptozoology, and then in 1955, Bernard Heuvelman's uh, coined it again, and uh, and then it came into print in, for the first time in 1959. Anything okay, else, John? Uh, I'm curious. Um, how many new species are usually found uh, a year, or or have been in the last century that uh, scientists have found? Well, that's that's a hard one. I mean, you you get there's reports every day of new species being found. Uh, the the group that put together Everest, uh, you know, Expedition Everest sent an expedition in October over the Himalayas, and they found five new frogs and a couple new birds and uh, a new kind of mouse. There's the Lost World of, the, of New Guinea that was found recently, where they found, uh, they're saying right now they know of 21 new species that they've found. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's large animals found all the time, probably about a hundred in the last uh, 50 years there's been a hundred species that people talk about a lot like uh, 
you know, like the Mega Mouse Shark or uh, or some of the other big animals. Did I get it for you, John? Uh, do you think um, organisms are still evolving now through time and uh, changing? I certainly do. I mean, I think that uh, animals are changing uh, as we speak. It's just the nature of, of uh, you know, biology and zoology. Okay. Thank you, sir, for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks, John. Interesting man. Thank you. Okay, and with that, we're going to take a short break. If you'll hang on the line with us, Lauren, um, we'll be back um, here with you in, um, oh, I don't know, about um, uh, four minutes. If that's okay. okay? All right. Okay. And uh, we'll be taking your calls right here on World of the Unexplained in just a moment. You're listening to the OmniSound Radio 1 Network, www.omnisoundradio1.net. There are some things in this world that go way beyond human understanding. Things that cannot be explained. Things that most people don't want to know about. But we're going to talk about them anyway. World of the Unexplained with Jay Scott and Trent Blackie. Heard Mondays live from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern on the OmniSound Radio 1 Network. Right here, baby. www.omnisoundradio1.net And we're back. We're back, guys, with uh, Lauren Coleman. Lauren, you still hanging with us? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Are we still sending muffled? Oh, yes. But it, it's interesting. I could hear the female voice quite well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got, uh, we've got a couple of uh, reporters here from my old... Oh, uh, reporters, not groupies, huh? No, no, no. <laughs> no, we shoved them out, you know. Uh, <laughs> we, we saved them for after the show. Right. <laughs> yeah. we, uh, they're, they're from uh, my old alma mater, Guilford College. Actually, one of the guys is uh, from Maine. And uh, he had asked what that number was that I had called. He said, "I, I thought you, I saw you dial a two o. Well, I'm not going to give I'm not going to give the area code out on the air, but um, he no, said that's it was two o seven in Portland, Maine. I mean, all the state of Maine is two o seven. Oh, wow, well, that covers a big area. Code. Yeah. So he said, "I thought you dialed, you know, Maine." And I was like, uh, "Yeah." And he's from Maine, so that's what we were talking about. They're looking over our show, writing a little piece up about us, and uh, they're really interested in what you've got going on here. Yep. Great. <laughs> Well, good good night to stop by then. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, hmm. I, I'm not exactly sure where I was going to go with that, but uh, or <laughs> I'm sorry, I was talking the to female my, voice. No, the no, 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 <laughs> no. Actually, I really, was like, I really got you off track. Then. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, we're t okay. We were talking about why can't you find a, a body of the Bigfoot in the woods? And there's a that's a completely right. valid so let argument. Me, let me just finish that thought because okay. I wanted to get to the porcupine. The porcupines and rodents are extremely important because, for instance, in Maine, you have deer and moose all over the state dropping antlers. The whole forest bed would be covered with antlers if it wasn't for the, the porcupine and the rodents eating those up. And that's what happens to bones, too. Any animal that's dying in the woods is going to disappear you know, remarkably quickly. I mean, some people have said two days, but let's, let's, you know, conservatively within a week, you're going to have a body disappearing. And uh, the other thing that occurs and what we think is going on with Bigfoot, Sasquatch, is that they are probably living in small groups and hiding their bodies or burying them. And so why should we expect uh, when we can't find a dead bear, and if the bear population is probably a thousand bear to every one Bigfoot, why is it that if we can't fa find bear dying all over the woods, we should expect to see a ne you know find a needle in the haystack body of a Bigfoot? It just doesn't make sense. So uh, that's that's usually my response to that is that uh, we have records where Bigfoot have been killed or Bigfoot-like creatures, and those most often have happened during wartime, uh, you know, in Russia, in Mongolia, in Pakistan, in uh, Vietnam. There's all these cases, and, and also in the 1700s uh, during the Indian Wars in North America, where people were killing Bigfoot-type creatures, abominable snowmen, Yeti, Amas, different things like that, but because they're in the midst of a war or a military action, they could care less about natural history or science or, you know, preserving a body, and they're interested in the enemy. And so, uh, you know, it's just 
the two haven't matched up yet where someone has uh, accidentally shot or uh, you know a lumber truck hasn't hit a bigfoot or or things like that where a body hasn't been discovered so so uh, the other thing is um, we're a MTV generation and we have a short attention span we want everything to be discovered right away uh -huh. But if you look at uh, how long it took the giant panda or the mountain gorilla to be discovered, 60 and 70 years, uh, why should we expect to have all of a sudden found Bigfoot when really the modern era of Bigfoot starts in 1958? So we just have to be a little more patient. Now, do, do you uh, think that there's been a resurgence in, in the... I think we have a color. Oh, we do? I saw the light flash. Oh, that was the camera flashing behind you. Um, do you think that Don't there's be been a, that stuff there, there, Do you think that really there's cut back on those drugs? <laughs> right. <clears throat> do you think there's been a resurgence in the popularity of these kind of creatures? I know Frank Peretti. Um, wrote a book called Monster a few years ago, and I, I don't know if uh, a lot of fiction writers now are, are seeming to, to put out books um, geared to that, you know, into that genre. Do you think that that's that's helping increase, um, you know, maybe sightings, maybe um, things of that nature? Uh, no, I think that the, the crypto fiction, as we call it, the uh, Bigfoot stories, the Sasquatch, you know, books like The Lock are really a reflection of how popular cryptozoology and nonfiction cryptozoology has become. I've been doing this for 46 years now, and I've seen, uh, when I was first involved in writing back and forth with Ivan Sanderson in the 60s, he and I used to talk about that we were one of the few people in the eastern uh, United States that were interested in Bigfoot and different things like that. And now, you know, people are all over. There's hundreds, I get hundreds of emails a day. Uh, there's, you know, different people uh, clicking on to Crypto Mundo all the time. I, I mean, it's just, it's been an explosion of interest. And considering that one of the first times that the word cryptozoology was even said aloud on a TV program was on the X Files. Uh, you can see how things have changed. Wow! You know, there's there's series that cryptozoology can be long statements or you know parts of the plot. Um, in the last three years, since the flories, you know, the the little hobbits have been discovered. It's just the increase in cryptozoology interest is, is phenomenal. The ivory-billed woodpecker being discovered, the giant squid being filmed in the ocean. You know, there's just so many events that relate to cryptozoology. Uh, I, I can't... You know, people ask me, how do I find enough material to put on my daily blog, uh, Crypto Mundo? And, and I'm saying I'm turning away stories because there's just... <laughs> You know, I put two or three stories up a day, and I could put five or six if I had all the time. Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the, the giant squid. You know, I, I know Trent and I talked about uh, Con Tiki, the Tor Heyerdahl novel. The giant squid really, really bothers me a lot. Yeah, but, you, you know, some of the lights and some of the mysterious things that he saw on that balsa wood raft in the middle of the ocean. Right. That may not approach some of these bigger ships cause they may because they may be scared of the... The, the engine noise yeah, would exactly. keep them away. And it's just amazing. I mean, there's all kinds of things out there in this, this huge world that we, you know, that, that, that human beings haven't touched. And, um, yeah. you know, I mean, their opportunities are really endless. Oh, exactly. And that's what I've, I've really found about the recent sea serpent stories is that because there's highways in the ocean now, there's really sea lanes, that uh, we're missing out on seeing a lot of sea serpents and new animals because they just avoid these highways in the ocean now. And they're, uh, it's the yachts the little boats, the, it's the contikis that are seeing these creatures now. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess what are the um, the hunt for these creatures, are they are they mainly in the hands of uh, individuals such as yourself, or do you think they're larger organizations, I, I mean like government organizations or big scientific conglomerates, you know, I mean <clears throat> it would seem to me that there would be some advantage to searching for these things um, are they actively pursuing these things, or, or are they sort of taking a step back and letting you guys handle well, the work? I, 
think that there's many different ways to look at that. If you're if you're talking about new species of new animals and new habitat, there's there's different nonprofits, uh, private nonprofits around the world, the Flora and Fauna Society and you know World Wildlife Fund and conservation groups that are are trying to pursue some of that work. As far as the strict cryptozoological work, uh, you know, looking for some of the the more popular animals like Bigfoot and Yeti and things like that, there are nobody that's really doing that uh, with any funding. Most of us are doing this, you know, on our own private lives, trying to get together, you know, the money to go on expeditions or, you know, doing weekend warrior stuff. That's a very popular term among uh, Bigfooters. You know, they're going out there doing these little uh, treks and and that's one of the major problems in cryptozoology in the 1960s, 1950s. You had a couple millionaires that were supporting that. If you look back 100 years, uh, you know, at the beginning of the last century in the 1900s, 1800s, you had zoos, museums, and uh, zoological societies that were actively trying to collect the new animals, and so they were funding expeditions to find the Okapi or to find the, the Mount Gorilla and uh, the same with the giant panda. You just don't see that level of funding around anymore. It's a, a much more conservative world that we're in as far as funding cryptozoology. Yeah, I know, I know a lot of our listeners have um, probably seen you on um, some of the different uh, cable television channels out there, Discovery. Uh, history and things like that. And if you want to talk to him, give us a call here at 800-960-2289. That number again is 1-800-960-2289. Or you can reach us locally at 336-996-1596. The numbers are on our website, worldoftheunexplained.com. Or you can just jump in the chat room with us and ask your questions there. Yeah, there was a uh, quite a bit of... Uh over the winter on Travel Channel, they had a whole new series called Weird Travel. Uh-huh. And, uh, yeah, there was a show on Mothman, a show on uh, Yeti, a show on the Loch Ness Monster and Champ, and uh, they'd interviewed me about all of those. So, uh, uh, I, you know, I heard that uh, almost every other night people were saying they were seeing me. So <laughs> I did, hopefully it didn't get too boring, but... Uh, it certainly was a lot of fun to talk to those people as they came here to Maine to interview me. Oh, what's yeah. your What's your website again? Uh, LaurenColeman dot com. Okay, that's L O R E N. L O R E N. I apologize. I miss I, I misspelled your name at the bottom of our site. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I, I did fix that though. <laughs> okay, uh, LaurenColeman dot com, and then on Crypto Mundo, which is a crypto, and then all one word M U N D O. Dot com. And Crypto Mundo is where I do my daily blog. Okay, great. Hmm. So uh, how do you go about uh, writing your books? I mean, um, I guess uh, the process, if you will, uh, gathering the information and whatnot, especially your more recent ones. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I tend to uh, focus on a subject and uh, sit down. Oftentimes, I've written an article or written a series of articles that I want to combine and expand. And So, for instance, uh, the difference between uh, the field guide books that I did, the field guide to lake monsters and sea serpent, and the field guide to Bigfoot, those are, are done on a case-by-case -case basis. I take um, Patrick Weege and I took 50 cases that we wanted to look at in depth. We wanted to... Uh, pick out the best of the best, you know, the scientist that says he's seen something, the, the police officer, the, the very close eyewitness that is a typical sighting for a specific kind of animal that we want to talk a little bit more about. And so those, uh, those books, those field guides, they have those 50 cases, and then right next to them is a drawing of the creature. Uh, when I wrote Bigfoot, uh, the true story of apes in America, I really want to look look historically at this creature, and so I started way back when with the native peoples, and then I I really went up through, uh, you know, the Patterson film, the different incidents like the cripple foot uh, case, or the looking at uh, Bigfooters and, and how their influence uh, had really made an impact on the field. 
or even documentary films or how how did uh, how did Bigfoot change in terms of its look around Harry and the Hendersons <laughs> and then and then of course I'm very interested in the the Minnesota Iceman and I wanted to look at that case and talk about that and, you know was there a body that was actually found and had a billionaire uh, hidden the the real body and replaced it with a model and looking a little bit at the controversial cases like that or or Ray Wallace who said that he had faked uh, footprints and created Bigfoot uh, was there any validity to that or was that just a man that uh, had been lying and storytelling mm -hmm. for all of his life and his uh, children naturally uh, when he died wanted to carry on that legacy so that Ray Wallace could have the ultimate final laugh hmm. so uh, you know I look at that the things differently and I sit down and I just write and uh, write and write and write and uh, get up very early in the mornings to write usually hmm. huh. this is a sort of a, <clears throat> a little bit of a segue but not really um, have you done any uh, discussion about <clears throat> excuse me Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay when he climbed Mount Everest and apparently he allegedly came back or or he after he did that he went on a sort of a, a bit of a crusade to look for evidence of uh, yetis and apparently he came up with a like a yeti scalp or something like that um, have you done any work uh, involving that yeah I wrote a book called uh, Tom Slick uh, True Life Encounters in Cryptozoology it's an earlier version of that book was uh, Tom Slick and the Search for the Yeti and I have a whole chapter in there about Sir Edmund Hillary uh, and I call it Sir Ed, uh, you know, Edmund Hillary and the Assassination of Yeti mm -hmm. because uh, Hillary uh, was very damaging in what he did uh, even though in the 50s he had a much more open mind about Yeti and brought back stories and sightings and different things uh, when he went on the 1960 World Book Expedition uh, which I believe in many ways was a cover a cover story for him, some intelligence work that he was doing to spy on the Chinese and look at the rockets that were going off from Tibet. But he went into that and, uh, you know, he, he made a big deal that he was going to look for the Yeti, and that was the cover story that got written up in the Chicago Daily Mail and, I mean, the Chicago Daily News and the World Book and, and different things like that. But and they act like that the uh, scalp of the Yeti was uh, the real scalp of a Yeti, when in fact, as long ago as 1954, when the Daily Mail expedition went there, they were quoting the Sherpas as saying these were relics made in imitation of the Yeti scalp. And there's no way that the Sherpas had ever said, or the Lamas had ever said, that these were real skull caps. So when uh, Hillary and uh, Marlon Perkins and all of those guys got a lot of publicity and brought the scalps back to, uh, you know, be on press conferences in Chicago and Paris and different places like that, Sir Edmund Hillary uh, already knew that they were fakes and had a fake that he had made for him in his suitcase right next to the one that he was showing, which he very ceremoniously towards the end of his tour pulled out and said, here, I know what made this. This was a, a saro, which was a goat antelope that's uh, found in the Himalayas that they used to, to make the fakery. Hmm. So uh, it was all a big con <clears throat> job, and uh, Sir Edmund Hillary should be ashamed of himself. He, he also said that he found the hand of a Yeti, which the Tom Slick expedition had found years before and had actually stolen and taken part of the hand of the Yeti, and then... Uh, replaced it with the uh, bones of a human being, and that's what he Sir Edmund Hillary was able to write up and said, well, there was wire on this, and it looked like part of a human <laughs> hand, <laughs> and that's because it was. Oh, wow. <laughs> Guess that, that... So that's all written up in my uh, Tom Slick book, and, and actually I was on Unsolved Mysteries uh, in the early 1990s about that whole case and, and was interviewed about that, and so it's, it's so sometimes shown in reruns, and is a very interesting uh, little melodrama that goes on there with the Yeti and the Himalayas and Sir Edmund Hillary. Well, I actually saw you on a, on a, it was a FX program uh, on the Mothman, actually, the other day. We were watching that. Um, you know, they had some clips of you in an interview that they had done. I think Sony had put that together. I'm not sure. 
Oh yeah, is that uh, that was the search for the Mothman? Yeah, I yeah. didn't know that was rebroadcast. Oh uh, uh, yeah, it, it wasn't rebroadcast. I had a friend of mine that had actually taped it and put it on a DVD and gave it to me to, to watch. Oh, yeah, if you get the special edition of the the Mothman Prophecies movie, they have that documentary on there. And why I like to, I mean, you know, I'm on the documentary, so is John Keel. Uh -huh. But why I really like that documentary is because they were able to. Uh, hunt down and track down some of the archival footage from 1966 oh, yeah. of, of the eyewitnesses and of the bridge collapsing and different things like that. Hmm. So it's kind of a unique documentary. Oh yeah, definitely. But you're, you're definitely always on TV and always in the, um, in the media. Always in the limelight. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's your biggest selling book right now, Warren? Um, as far as the most popular? The, the classic that everybody likes so much is... Uh, Mysterious America that came out in 1983, and uh, that just went out of print. And then Simon and Schuster is bringing out a new paperback edition of it next fall. Okay. So uh, Pearview Press recently told me that uh, surprisingly, last month the Mothman book was my number one seller. Really? Yeah. I mean, I I was totally surprised. I know that uh, the book that sells most of any of them uh, from all publishers seems to be cryptozoology A to Z. Yeah. So that's a, a handbook that came out in uh, 1999. It has 200 entries in it, and a lot of school libraries and, uh, and students talk to me about that book because uh, they use it to, for reports, and it has you know, about 60 biographies of different people and all of the cryptids from around the world, so it's a very comprehensive book. Yeah, inspiring quite a lot of uh, young kids to uh, do what we did and uh, pick it up. Yeah, yeah, pick it up yeah, and I mean, look at it. Somebody told me the other day they were uh, substitute teaching in a fourth grade class, and uh, she was asking people what they wanted to be when they grew up, and somebody said they wanted to be a cryptozoologist. So <laughs> oh, wow. Fantastic. And, so I guess I'm partially responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> probably so, probably so. <laughs> Well, we're going we're gonna to take a, another short break here, and we'll be back with Lauren Coleman. We'll give you the numbers when we uh, come back, so just hang tight. Yeah, and we'll be back on War of the Unexplained. We're back, guys. And we're back. Lauren, you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Let's, uh, I guess let's take the... Uh, Shift gears take here. Take the car and <laughs> send it to the water. Uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about I, the... Lake Monsters, and in particular, the most famous lake monster. Loch Ness Monster. The old Loch Nessie. Let me, let me give the numbers real quick first. Okay, the that. number is 800-960-2289, 800-960-2289, or 336-996-1596, or you can jump into chat with us at omnisoundradio1.net. Um, okay, let's talk about Loch Ness. Let's have a little history of the Loch Ness Monster, I guess. Um, okay, well, let me first create the setting in very graphic and spectacular fashion so people understand what we're talking about. This is a lake that's 20 mile, 21 miles long. Some places it's 800 to 1,000 feet deep. So there's enough water in Loch Ness to cover every person on Earth under six feet of water. Good God. That wow. Is, that's an amazing volume of water. Yeah, it, it uh, is. And so you can hide really a lot in such a vast bit of a uh, lake. The other thing that people don't uh, really kind of consider too often is that Loch Ness is only six miles from the ocean at one end there. And about 40 sightings of the Loch Ness Monster have been on land of creatures that have been variously described as slugs, as walruses, as, as kind of pokey camels that have been seen crossing roads or up on the beach. And so, uh, in my considered opinion, I think that we probably have got a population of large, giant seals or walrus-like animals that are communicating back and forth between the ocean and the loch. Um, and the whole idea that this is a you know kind of like a, a head that sticks out of the water is really not what most people are seeing and describing. Most people are seeing and describing something that looks like the back of a elephant or a hippo, 
and that's the most frequent sighting. Uh, the uh, long-necked creature really is is pretty rare and uh, has more to do with sometimes uh, wishful thinking than it does what people are seeing. So the other thing that's going on is most Americans and Canadians tend to think of the Loch Ness Monster as a mammal uh -huh. because it, it has hair, it has eyelashes, it has a mane, and yet the British idea is that this is a reptile left over from the age of the dinosaurs, a plesiosaurus, and that's been the popular notion over in uh, really much more in England than in, even in Scotland. But certainly uh, it's confusing to people when they see the picture of a recreation of the Loch Ness Monster and it looks like it's a, a dinosaur from the you know dinosaur ages, and yet if they start reading about the Loch Ness sightings, uh, these creatures have uh, you know flippers like seals. They they have uh, you know eyelashes and they breathe. And, and the other thing that uh, we know is that a reptile goes through the water uh, left to right in a motion like a snake in water. And yet mammals go up and down, up and down, uh, like they're porpoising. And the sightings of the Loch Ness Monster are of a creature that's going up and down like a porpoise or a seal, not left and right like a, a, a fish or a reptile. Huh. So that's often, those little details are, are sometimes forgotten in looking at the analysis. But uh, I think it's, it's helpful to know that because if we have a warm-blooded mammal, it's a lot easier to understand this very cold lake and many cold lakes like uh, Lake Champlain where Champ or Lake Okanagan where you have Ogopogo. Those lakes are very cold northern lakes and uh, we're talking about uh, a, really a band of, around the earth that we call the monster latitudes and the monster latitudes are where these lake monsters live. Now what do you, what do you make of the, the notorious uh, photo uh, that, that everyone always shows the blurry picture of the, the, the neck and the head protruding from the water in Scotland. Right. Well, the surgeon's photo taken uh, April of uh, 1934. The surgeon's photo is very famous, but uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Wilson never said that he had thought he saw the Loch Ness Monster. He just thought it was an unusual creature. And I think that many of us from for a uh, for really a very long time have said that this is probably nothing more than a, a, a otter's tail going down in the water. Uh -huh. And of course the debunkers have uh, in recent years said that this is a, a little toy submarine. And they're, they always say, well, you know, why didn't the doctor tell us more? And why didn't he, uh, you know, talk more about it? Why is he being so secretive? Well, the secret behind the surgeon's photograph and Dr. Wilson and his, uh, his secretive quietness about this is he was on, an, on a vacation having an affair with a married woman. Oh, <laughs> well. He didn't want to be too, uh, too obvious or talk to the, rush to the media to talk to people about the, the photograph because that was one part of it. The other part of it is he says that uh, he noticed there was something in the lock when he'd gone to the shore of the lock to relieve himself. <laughs> so, uh, you know, for the very proper British uh, surgeon in the 1934, there was two situations there that he just didn't <laughs> want to talk about too much. Oh, man. Uh, we've got a uh, question from uh, one of the people in our chat room, and um, they ask, he's asking, uh, what, what does he think of the latest sighting in Lake Champlain that was caught on video by two fishermen? He says it's on video. They call him Champ. Is he real? And he said Lake Champlain, New York, near Plattsburgh, New York. Yeah, the Lake Champlain monster's been seen since 1812. And uh, it was so famous that P.T. Barnum put out a reward on the capture of why he called the quote-unquote sea serpent, even though it was a lake monster. I, I have seen the recent uh, footage. It shows uh, something that's long and and uh, unknown near a boat, uh, you know, near a uh, something that was uh, steaming across uh, Lake Champlain. It's hard to tell what it is. Uh, you know, some people have said it looks like a dog swimming in the water, even though you can't see the head. Uh, as far as I know, it's unknown right now. It's uh, still good footage, 
and certainly Lake Champlain Monster, which seems a little bit different than uh, the Loch Ness Monster. You oftentimes get reports of it being rather long, uh, almost as if it may be a giant sturgeon, and that's uh, always a possibility. In fact, a lot of the debunkers of the of Nessie feel that the lake, uh, you know, Loch Ness Monster is nothing more than a sturgeon, but that that certainly doesn't seem to be true in Loch Ness. But uh, it may be part of what's going on with uh, of the champ in Lake Champlain. Now, do, have you, do you, um, in in your in your studies of these uh, different creatures, have you ever personally observed any of these creatures? I mean, I'm talking about Bigfoot, Loch Ness, any any of the creatures that you have written about have you personally observed no no i found footprints i've heard screeches uh you know i went on a two-week expedition to loch ness in 1999 i've been to to lake champlain um, a few times uh, i've gone to every state in the united states except alaska looking for these creatures interviewing witnesses and, you know i've seen strange uh dark colored cats in Illinois and, and in Florida and different things like that. And maybe they were cryptids, maybe it was a misidentification, but certainly I've not seen a Nessie or Champ or Ogopogo or, or Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Skunk Ape, different things like that. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of a, as a cryptozoologist, you're part skeptic, part investigative reporter, and part psychologist. And, and certainly, uh, it doesn't bother me that I haven't seen anything. Okay. Um, <clears throat> go ahead, Trent. Did you? Yeah, actually, um, <clears throat> uh, the other thing that I was going to uh, make a comment about uh, Loch Ness, and I'm not sure how Lake Champlain or other lakes uh, favor up to it, but Loch Ness is also, um, isn't the visibility very, very poor in Loch Ness? It's, it, it, um, I guess peat runs off into it or something like that. So um, it's it's a very dark, Murky. cold. It's a very dark, cold lake. I don't know about Lake Champlain or anything like that, but um, is that not true? That's true. the The peat uh, content in Loch Ness is is extreme to the point where you can put your hand in front of your face underwater and you can't really see it. And the other thing that surprised me when I was over there is is the har, as they call it, which is uh, the fog that rolls in almost every morning uh, in the summer. And it's a very, very thick fog. Um, you know, it has a, uh, the highlands are, are extremely cold. And of course, because of the midnight sun, uh, the daylight is, is out uh, a lot. So you, uh, I mean, I used to read these old reports of, uh, you know, 10 o'clock at night, somebody said they saw something and they could describe it quite well. And I couldn't understand what was going on until I was over there and it was 10.30 at night and the sun was really bright. I mean, I thought it was the middle of the day. My, my son and I had jet lag and we fell asleep and woke up and the clock said 10 o'clock and we thought it was the mid middle of the morning and it was almost the middle of our night. So wow. It's, you know, there's a lot of little surprising things about Loch Ness that uh, until you're there, you don't really get it. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, Lake Champlain, I think the thing that, uh, it's a clearer lake, it's a, a much different kind of situation. But uh, the thing that we have to try to figure out is what is going on there because almost every year it freezes over. Loch Ness doesn't freeze over, but uh, Lake Champlain does, and and yet you have reports, and I have uh, I have scientific reports from old journals that that they found harbor seals from the Atlantic Ocean in Lake Champlain, and uh, you just wonder how some of these animals are getting in there. Okay, well we have a uh, <clears throat> a question from the chat room that says um, <coughs> roughly. What does the guest think about the argument that there's not enough room in the lock for a breeding population? That's to say, if there's a rather large creature of some sort and it's been living there for centuries, that you would sort of get the um, situation where you would have um, not enough genes in the gene pool, so to speak, and also just the food resources and, uh, and such. Now, lock nest is huge, but <clears throat> you know, a, a rather large creature would require a great amount of food you know, for itself, not to mention, you know, its cousins, its sisters, you know, its children. Uh, right, right. But, I mean, I, I don't have any 
problem with explaining that because I don't think that these creatures are, are lock, lock locked, so to speak. I don't think that they are, you know, just live there. I find that the evidence is pretty compelling that you probably have transportation between the ocean and the lock, almost as if the lock may be uh, an ancestral home that they may come to, to uh, you know, eat or to breed or do different things like that. Mm -hmm. But these creatures probably could live in the ocean, and then they just occasionally come to the lock. And uh, so there's not an overpopulation there because uh, you obviously have a, an outlet. I mean, six miles away from the ocean, these creatures are crossing the land and seen on the land by people. Uh, the reason that uh, the the sightings really start with a bang in 1933 <clears throat> is because a new road was constructed around the lock in which trees were knocked down. So it was the first time that people could really see the lake in a very good, ob observant fashion. And uh, yet we have cases from the 1400s, from, you know, 6th century A.D. of uh, people seeing strange things in the River Ness and in Loch Ness. So uh, I think we've got a lot going on there for uh, many, many centuries, and it has nothing to do with animals that are just there and breeding and dying off and living in Loch Ness. I think they're living other places, too. Well, certainly. I remember actually one account. I can't remember the name of the saint, but apparently a saint had walked around Loch Ness, and he had seen the creature, <clears throat> just like you're talking about, in the six or 700s, and he made the sign of the cross, and he, he chased it away. Right, um, St. Columbo. Yeah, okay. That, that, that's the one. So do, yeah. you, do you believe that the creature, that if, if, it were, if it was a creature that was spotted in, in the 30s, do you believe that that same creature could still be alive today, or do you believe that, that, I mean, I don't know how long these creatures live. Do you have any idea or any conclusions that you've made from your research uh, regarding that? Well, I, I accept or deny, uh, you know, information I don't believe, uh, because I really think people that are believers are, are almost like religious fanatics, and that we as cryptozoologists have to be careful about the use of that word. So as far as what I, I accept, as going on in Loch Ness, there's no way that I would consider the same animal. You know, it's kind of like people that say, well, there's one abominable snowman, he's white, and he's in the Himalayas, and he's always lived on Mount Everest. It's the same as far as people coming to me and thinking there's one Nessie, and it's always been that same Nessie for thousands and thousands of years. It's just, uh, it's illogical and it's biologically impossible and not at all what we consider is going on in Loch Ness. There's probably a breeding population. There's been more than one Nessie seen at a time. There's even some people that have said they've seen little Nessies along with the, the mom and papa Nessie. And, you know, you get all kinds of sightings, but some of them actually do seem uh, credible that there are family groups. There's credible reports of them crossing the road. There's credible reports of them coming out on the beach area and, and sort of lying there like a, a giant uh, sea turtle or something, except they have a, a little bit bigger body and bigger flippers and different things like that. So you're getting a lot of different... Uh, I mean, the whole thing about cryptozoology, and I this is something else I point out to people, is a sighting is nothing more than a, a thumbnail sketch, a slice of life, that may have nothing at all to do with what, what or how these animals more normally exist in the world. Uh, when you consider that it takes a human being with a more or less semi-ideal observation conditions and good weather to see a Bigfoot crossing a road or a, a Loch Ness monster in a lock, those are really aren't what those creatures, those cryptids are doing most of the time. Uh, you know, most Bigfoot don't cross the road. They stay in the woods. Most lake monsters don't come near the shore and are seen by eyewitnesses. They're probably feeding in some other part of the lock or even in the ocean. So uh, people sometimes take a small bit of information from a sighting and make a book out of it or a grand theory or something like that 
when I really say let's be more cautious, you know, uh, maybe the reason that there's a lot of Bigfoot reports in that one area is because they're all juvenile Bigfoots and they're just having a party. I mean, we, we don't know. And we just, you know, to have people construct these elaborate theories of migration routes and family groups and the living in tunnels and, and all kinds of things like that, it, it just sometimes gets very bizarre. Hmm. That's true. I mean, <clears throat> the behind these uh, mysterious creatures, there's a mysterious life cycle that, um, as of yet, we really don't know a whole lot about. But, I mean, you know, they have to follow the sort of uh, um, tenets of other standard animals. You know, they breed, they eat, they pass away, you know. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I, yeah, guess I mean, one of the reasons in my book, Bigfoot, The True Story of Apes in America, uh, that I wrote the chapter called Sex and the Single Sasquatch <laughs> is because uh, I think we're really beyond talking about whether or not these creatures exist and it's time to talk about their, you know, their breeding cycle or their sex lives or, uh, you know, their genitalia in a way that, that we talk about uh, chimpanzees and bonobos and orangutans, uh, different lifestyle and natural history, and, and yet we... We tend to put Bigfoot in this area in which we're afraid to talk about those things, but we really need to talk about them that way. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely a um, something that has to go forward, um, you know, to find out more information. I, you know, I, I tend to agree with you there as far as, you know, why these creatures aren't, haven't been spotted, you know, by by more people or why it's because that they're they're hiding, basically. We're not really hiding, but they're staying away from from the machinery and the things, you know, the, the roads and the, and the sea, you know, the, the sea traveling vessels that are, that are large, um, because there is a big noise there. And I mean, if I were, I assume if I were a creature, you know, like, um, something like that, I would stay away from that too. Just any kind of wild creature. You, you don't want to be around these factories. You don't want to be around things that are getting built. You know, you want to go back to your home. You want to kind of hibernate back into that, that area that you're comfortable in. Yeah, exactly. Uh Dr. Uh, Carlton Kuhn, uh, an anthropologist, once gave a talk on Sasquatch, and he said, if the meek shall inherit the earth, it'll probably be Sasquatch because they're smart enough to stay in the mountains away from the pollution. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, I guess I'm going to kind of steer away slightly, but it's a question that I was thinking about earlier when you were talking about um, lake monsters sort of sharing a similar environment, at least at least uh, Champy and Nessie and Ogopogo. I'm not exactly sure where Ogopogo is, but um, how does that <clears throat> how does that relate to some of the things that we some of the some of the things that we hear uh, found in the tropics? That's to say, I, I, I want to say that the creature's name is like Mokele Mbembe or something something that's found in the Congo and in uh, Central Africa. That's also like an aquatic monster. The Mokele Mbembe. Uh Yep. Supposedly, like a dinosaur, uh, lives in a, a very swampy environment, uh, has really been reported from the Cameroons and from the Congo. Uh, since the 1900s, there's been expeditions, dinosaur expeditions, looking for those creatures. And there's, there's sort of two different variations uh, uh, in, in different parts of the Cameroons and the Congo. One is there's the thing that used to be called, uh, you know, before we discovered that they don't exist, the Brontosaurus. The reason they don't exist is because the, sci the paleontologist put the wrong head on the wrong dinosaur. <laughs> anyway, the, the seropod dinosaurs, the ones that have the huge bodies and the long neck that were very famous in the beginning of Jurassic Park for uh, making those honking sounds and eating leaves and, and sneezing on the little girls. Anyway, those supposedly exist there, and in addition, there's a, a little dinosaur that's a little bit littler that has a point uh, horn on its head. Uh, uh, several of us are beginning to wonder if some of these aren't dinosaurs, but maybe they're an aquatic form of a swamp-dwelling uh, rhinoceros. And just like the aquatic version of the elephant is, we today we know is the pygmy elephant, there could be a smaller version of rhinos that are more aquatic living and may be in some of these swampy areas. Huh. So there may be a, a new rhino that's hiding b behind all of these reports of dinosaurs. And, 
And yet uh, the Bokilio Mbembe certainly are some good stories that have been around for a long time. And, and through the Christian missionaries over there, we're getting some good reports because they live among the, the pygmies now, and they're uh, doing a lot of translating and a lot of help for a lot of expeditions that are going over there, including a, another one that I think is going to go over there uh, this coming October. That's uh, very exciting, actually. <clears throat> uh, if it were a dinosaur, um, assuming that it were, then it would make sense that it would choose it would its habitat would be a place like Central Africa. Um, that's to say, a, a place that was hit the least during the last ice age. You know, and um, any other kind of creature that that would have survived that epoch would clearly find itself in a in a in a subtropical area. I imagine. Oh, definitely, and I think it, re it replicates uh, the conditions in the Jurassic. But uh, to to think that there's a Jurassic dinosaur still living is a, is certainly a stretch. Although we do know the the coelacanth, the giant six foot long fish that was found off of uh, South Africa in 1938, and then more recently in 1998 in Indonesia, a, a whole population of coelacanth was discovered there those kinds of creatures as well as other living fossils have been found and uh, it's just that dinosaurs would be such such a huge uh, discovery it would really kind of shake up science so. absolutely we got a caller yeah just a second hello this is your sister trent hey uh. <laughs> hey i have a very interesting question about something i had read in the book of job about the ancient lizards that walk the earth and it's in great detail uh, discussing the Leviathan of Job's time, which was six or 8,000 years ago. And I just was wondering what your um, guess tonight for the 41st, it's the 41st chapter of Job. And, it talk, right. uh, and it's uh, talking about the Leviathan, it, it's, let's see where it says his, uh, who can strip off his outer armor, who can come within his double mail, like the mail of a armor mail. His strong scales are his pride shut up as with a tight seal. He sneezes out flashes forth of light. Out of his mouth comes, goes burning torture, torches, sparks of fire leap forth. And what do you think about that? Well, the Leviathan, the Bathomas, uh, a lot of the creatures in the Bible um, have been variously interpreted to be uh, everything from uh, dinosaurs to... Um, to, you know, uh, things like the whale or, right. uh, or right. sharks or different things like that. The Leviathan is a little bit harder because you look through the Bible and uh, you see it in many different ways. Okay. In modern Hebrew, the Leviathan means whale, but uh, what you're talking about is much more like a crooked serpent uh, like, uh, you know, food for the desert people. Right. It seems to be cre um, more like what we today think about sea serpents or giant sea monsters. And, of course, we don't exactly know what those are until we find one. But uh, certainly the Bible has a lot of different creatures that can be uh, certainly quickly uh, put into cryptozoology, like the kraken, which right. was a giant uh, squid. And the behemoths here right above it. it. This part of Job is describing many large creatures during that period of time or somehow that have been passed down information about these creatures. Massive legs as big as cedars is what they say, walking the earth. No sword can per, uh, permeate the skin of these animals like they tried to hunt them or I don't know. <laughs> I'm just right. very well, curious. What's interesting is uh, in most of the time in uh, Hebrew thought, you get a much more quick equation that these animals are cryptids, that they're unknown, that they're sea serpents, whereas uh, in some Christian faith, uh, the Leviathan is quickly translated into Satan or the devil. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, you know, it depends on interpretation, but I tend to think that the Leviathan probably is some kind of, uh, you know, informed yet fuzzy remembrance of the dragon slash sea serpent. Since they said that it spits acid and out of its nose comes smoke. And, right. and this, I've read the entire book of Job, and as it got to this point, the pretense in which it was 
characterizing these animals was not mythology. They were they were explaining them as if God did God created these animals specifically land or water. And this one seemed to be on land at times, not only in the water. Right. Um, right. Anyway, <laughs> so cro- crocodiles come on land too. And oh, that's right. Int- what's interesting about uh, crocodiles have a f- very fierce hiss, and if you read in the ancients, they oftentimes would talk about horses snorting fire yes. so that sometime is uh, um, just the way that it was discussed back in those times and there is still some smaller lizard on some island that you I saw on Discovery Channel that it it actually hisses acid that will burn the, the plant life and vegetation like it's a descendant of larger lizards that actually bur- breathed out acid or fire from their noses or their mouths somehow right. and, and the Komodo dragon of course has a bite that is filled with so many bacteria and other poisonous microbes that it will quickly kill any animal. Exactly. So, so if you're talking about something that's a, a real-life dragon with a horrible bite, there's nothing like a Komodo dragon. Exactly. Well, so, even, so maybe um, 10,000 years ago, there could have been much larger uh, Komodo-style dragons that people were trying to kill, and these things were massively you know, terrorizing the areas where they roamed. Yeah, and uh, in fact, there's a creature that uh, was seen in Burma until the 1940s. It was called the Buru, and The Hunt for the Buru was a very famous book by uh, Ralph Izzard, who later went on to uh, be in one of the Yeti Abominable Snowmen expeditions in the Himalayas. And and that Buru is probably a giant monitor lizard because it had a lot of the same attributes. Yes, that's fascinating. You're just, uh, I've really enjoyed tonight um, checking in on my brother's program, uh, he and Scott, and getting to listen to all your information. (laughs) Okay, thanks, Serena. Thanks. Take care. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. (laughs) Just cut her off on the bye. We're going to have to take a short break. and uh, we're going to be right back with Lauren Coleman. I'll give the numbers when we come back because I've got something on a similar note that I wanted to bring up and see what Lauren thinks of that. But um, So we're going to return here probably in about, um, hmm, let's see, uh, three come on minutes, now. three minutes, four minutes. I'm looking for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, three minutes, ten seconds. We'll be right back. I'm Ward of the Unexplained. And we're back with Lauren Coleman. Scott, run the numbers. Lauren, run the numbers. Oh. The numbers, the phone numbers. Oh, the numbers, yeah. I was like, what, we're betting now? Uh, 800-960-2289. That number again is 800-960-2289. Or locally, 336-996-1596. Call us. Talk to uh, Lauren Coleman. And uh, right now, I've got a question for you, Lauren. Okay. Are you uh, familiar with any of Stephen Quill's work? He, uh, um, The Genesis 6 Giants and any of that? No. Okay. Okay. That was just a, a question that had, that had popped into my mind. I know he had, he had talked. He had mentioned something about you know because um, Valerie that called in a moment ago was mentioning the different things from the so, Bible and Serena. Oh, Serena. I thought it was Valerie that called <laughs> no. in. I'm sorry. No, that's he's got two sisters. I mix them up. Unbelievable. Um, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Serena. Sorry, Valerie. Uh, anyway, you know, the Genesis 6-4, there were giants on the earth in those days, and after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to oh, them. The the same. Yeah, and I was just wondering, because he, he has a book on that, and I'd heard him, um, I think, on Coast to Coast one night, and that just kind of uh, popped into my head when, when, I, when she had mentioned that question to you. And he's actually got a picture up on his side of these two really giant uh, humans uh, beside another human that isn't that tall. And I was just wondering if you had done any research into, I guess, ancient giants or anything like that. Well, I certainly um, understand and know what's going on with giants. I think that uh, human giants often are studied and confused with what's important in terms of, you know, Bigfoot and Gigantopithecus and and things like that. But they're really, um, you know, the, the hominoids, the hairy hominoids are are much different than the uh, human giants. And uh, the cannibal giants, Wendigo, those kinds of things are, are more of what we're studying for folklore and, and kind of to try to help us along understanding. I know there's uh, you know many people that are interested in the religious aspects. And, and for instance, among uh, the Mormons, there's a, a breakaway sect of uh, Mormons that... Uh, believe that Cain was a Bigfoot, no. for instance. 
and uh, there's books and websites and different things written about that. And, uh, you know, that's that's wonderful. People want to do that. It doesn't help me with getting any closer to finding Bigfoot, though. Yeah, yeah, obviously. I, just a side note that I wanted yeah. to throw out there. So, um, what's that? Oh, I thought you had something there. No. Oh, okay. But um, going back to Loch Ness and, the, and just Bigfoot and just ancient creatures in general that we haven't been able to find, um, but do you find that you're, I guess you're mostly, the most calls you get for interviews or the most um, uh, things of that nature, do you do you feel that they mainly, is Bigfoot the most popular item on the bill or Loch Ness or where are we standing at right now? Uh, I think that Bigfoot is the most popular. It seems like uh, human beings which are very egotistic, like to talk <laughs> about animals that are closest to them. So, uh, you know, it, and the closer you can get to America, which is the media market, then you have more people talking about Bigfoot versus Yeti, uh, more people talking about, uh, you know, the, the creatures in California versus ones in Alaska and different things like that. And yet, uh, you know, you, you do have some interesting things happen, like the Manitoba, uh, videotapes that occurred last uh, almost a year ago, last April, uh, where uh, uh, Bobby Clark up in Manitoba, who runs a ferry boat, uh, saw this creature across the way and had a very old-fashioned uh, camcorder, one of those big clunky ones. Oh, the dino and, cams. <laughs> yeah, and he, he, you know, popped it up there on his shoulder and took some footage, and unfortunately, you know, what we've got going on with some of that old... Uh, you know, videotape is that uh, it just doesn't give the kind of resolution that we can do any blowing up of the print. So it's a, a fuzzy brown thing on the other side of the bank, but uh, it's not it's not the Patterson Gimlin film, that's for sure. But th those things are exciting because you you hear you know the Yukon and uh, different Yukon had a whole series of reports about two years ago. Uh, Manitoba had one about a year ago, and then. Up in uh, Montana uh, last January, there were some new reports coming out of there of uh, Bigfoot. So we're getting getting areas that uh, are kind of out of the way, off the beaten track, and we're hearing from them, and that's always good. Okay, I've got a question from a guest in the chat room, and then I'm going to ask you to wrap things up. But um, <clears throat> has the guest heard of any supposed Bigfoot recordings, and if so, does he think that they're credible? I think the problem... With any Bigfoot recordings, and I have heard all of them, uh, you know, Sierra Sounds and, uh, you know, different places in Washington State, and, uh, you know, all of them are interesting, but they're only good as good as the people doing the recording because what these recordings are are nothing more than ear witness accounts because anybody can manipulate sounds. We know that you can go to any horror film and hear a Bigfoot screech. And we know that those are made in laboratories, they're made in studios. And so uh, I don't think that the Bigfoot sounds help us much because we really don't know if they really are, are real or not because sounds are so easy to fake. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> especially being in the studio. I know how one can uh, <laughs> tamper with things, <laughs> to oh, yeah. say the least. Sounds the first first thing that people tampered with. That's why we have music. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, well, we've got about uh, two more minutes, uh, Lauren, if you yeah. want to. Final comments yeah. about what we talked about tonight. Well, I, I think it's interesting. We started with Mothman, so we maybe should uh, end, with end there. And, <laughs> and the other thing that I think, uh, you know, especially if you have a lot of listeners in close to your home, is the old Santer, the S-A-N-T-E-R. Uh -huh. You know, those, that's a local myth in North Carolina, or legend, I should what, say. What was that again, Lauren? Santher, S-A-N-T-H-E-R? S-A-N-T-E-R. Oh, T-E-R. Yeah, maybe oh. I put H in there. Anyway, okay. there, there are certainly uh, some old legends from the 1800s of these large black panthers that are seen in North Carolina, and I think it's it's interesting how, you know, small different regional names like Mothman or the Center or, or, you know, even the Jersey Devil tend to really be the collectors of all kinds of lore, and we should, we should pay attention to them, and we should, you know, ask witnesses to be more descriptive and to give us more details, and, and yet uh, we'll, we'll find out something new every time. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much for uh, being on the show, Lauren. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, I hope you'll come back. Okay, great. Yeah, we'd love to have you back. Take yep. care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. <clears throat> that was Lauren Coleman. Yeah. What'd you Fantastic. think of that? Uh, uh, just too much, really, to talk about. Honestly, I, I know mean, it's always too much to talk about in the limited amount of time. I mean, that we seriously, have I, I, I mean, he's a really great guest, and uh, you know, I would. Oh, I'm sorry. Cryptozoology is such a cool topic, and then you can go on and on and on about it. You know, uh, really, just focus on one specific type of creature. Well, I've got you know, um, you know, I, I know we wanted to go into Mothman more, but I figured since we had Jeff Wamsley on last week, it'd probably be. You know, kind of a rehash, even though he's got a different take on it. And I know Jeff's got more of an ET take on it, and he's got more of a crypto take on it. But uh, okay, well, you guys know what time it is, right? Play the music, Scott. Hang on. Uh, we have twelve thousand nine hundred ninety-seven listeners. Come That's on, that's a lot of people. Not as many, not as many as I wanted, but I think those. Well, are more. I mean, there's some, <laughs> there's some tech diffs. So uh, yeah, and I'm thinking maybe people didn't uh, catch us because uh, yeah. they left or something. Lingering but, uh, elements of the Mothman from last week. You guys know the deal. If you're new to new to what we do, um, this this is uh, the Wotu Crack House Two Dollar Pyramid, and uh, you call us up. And um, uh, this today, I'm in a hot seat, right? You are. <laughs> Trent says these are difficult questions. It's about exorcism. We always try to focus on questions about the upcoming guest. And um, basically, he asked me five questions within a 30-second time period, but he asked you those questions first while I'm outside the studio, then I come back in, and uh, then I try to answer them, and whoever gets the most right wins. Now, if I get them all right, then uh, you lose. <laughs> Play the music. I, hang on. Oh. If I don't get them all right, then um, they win. And what's, what's in the crack house this week? You don't know? I don't know either. No. It's uh, <laughs> it's just a box <laughs> within a you box. guys. There may be some There's stuff crack in it. it. No. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's the, the, beast, <laughs> the beast of Adam Go Rightly by Adam Go Rightly, I guess, that's coming to our show later, uh, along with a Wotu key, keychain and a... Um, CD8 archive of your choice. Of your choice. One of our fine collections. Okay. Um, and with that, I'm going um, to have to cue the music here. Yep. Here we go. Um, where, where did the music go? There it is. Ladies and gentlemen, and those of other persuasions, lock your doors and hide your valuables because it's time now for another exciting round of the game show everybody's talking about in abandoned alleys everywhere. It's the one to crack house two dollar pyramid. So give it up for the tycoons of trivia, Jay Scott and Trent Lackey, who every week give away their stuff to some lucky listener. Dead air. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, all right. No. We, oh, there we go. You're, you're going to shave time off the callers. No, the call I'm not. I'm just checking to make sure it's working. <laughs> He's cheating. No, I'm kidding. Um, and we're here. Hey, we've actually got um, newspaper people here with us tonight, so they can they can tell you that we don't cheat. <clears throat> That's so, true. So, um, yeah. All right. Um, they're right behind. Say hi, guys. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So you know they're here and they're watching us, so they know that when I leave the studio that, that we're not cheating. Uh, but there's there's our caller wow, for the just crack like house, that. just okay. like just like clockwork. Caller, hello, hello, caller, caller, are you with us? It's on. We're up. It's like this like the Mothman thing last week. Hello, can you hear us? Huh. It's a Skype thing. And maybe, it may, if, uh, well, if you're hearing this, if you're getting this message, you've reached a number that has been, no, I'm kidding. Call us back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's working out great. Let me give those numbers, 1-800-960-2289. Or. Well, hang on. That's 800-960-2289. Or. 336-996-1596. How much more together can we be tonight, guys? We are on. We are really in rare form tonight. Oh, yeah. yeah we're on fire. We're bound to lose. Here. <laughs> so, um, actually, the question. Oh, uh, here's wait, the here we go. Caller? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Is this John? Yes, this is John from Messina, New York. John, you've never called the crack house before. Wow. <laughs> awesome. And I'm very excited. Are you going to win tonight? 
Let's hope. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, um, these questions are slightly hard. I, I <laughs> just, uh, you know, bear with it. It's it's a tough subject. To All right, I'm gonna questions. I'm gonna go outside, John. All right. Okay. Scott Make sure he knows how this is played. Okay. Do you know how this works, John? Thirty seconds, right? Thirty seconds. I have four questions tonight, so maybe you have a little slightly more time to think about the answers. Um, the topic, of course, is exorcisms. Um, and Scott is quietly leaving the studio now. Um, so are you, that's basically it. Are you, are you ready to go, John? Yes. Okay, well, we're going to start the timer now. From what culture was the first instance of exorcism found? Uh, Roman Empire? Uh, pretty close, but not quite. What are the three materials that are generally blessed during an exorcism? One materials, of the three. Materials? Uh, Just one of the three. Uh, uh, wo wood? No, no, uh, not rock? wood. Huh? Okay, what does the, the road name... What's that? The, the cross? Oh, no. Hmm. Well, I didn't get to the other two. Um... Well, I'll, I'll give him, uh, what was the name Beelzebub Be translate to? And uh, what's the name of the demon that Jesus cast out into the pig? Those are the other two questions. Can't think of that one, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like I said, they're tough questions. Um, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, Scott has equal opportunity to not get them right either. <laughs> um, let me go get them. Okay. Me to get none. Wow, none. these must be hard. They're pretty tough. No, see, even hard on the dog. <laughs> you got close on one. You got close on one. All right. Get back here. John, you with us? Yeah. John? Okay. Trent said these were hard. You didn't get any right, but you got close on one. Let me see. Let's see what I can do here. All okay. right. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Scott, you ready? I'm ready. What ain't, From what ancient culture is the first exorcism found? Um, Africa. Real close, but no. What are the three materials blessed during an exorcism? Holy water, crucifix, and um, the little shawl thingy. Well, like it's it. one of them. You got water. Okay. Uh, what does the name Beelzebub translate to? Devil. No. Satan? No. Okay. <laughs> And uh, in the book of uh, oh my gosh, Mark, I hope, what is the name of the demon that Jesus cast out into the pit? Legion. Oh. For they are many. Yeah, I guess so. Well, that's two. Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah. John. We'll still send you a keychain, though, and, um, <laughs> and we'll still no, send... No, what, what are you taking out? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking out the book. Man. Okay. I always take out the book. <laughs> Sorry about that, John. Um, we're, we're still... Gonna... the book. Huh? He loves the book, like always. Yeah, yeah I, I do. Yeah, because they're expensive, and we only get so many of them. Yeah, I think that's really what comes <laughs> Our down. guests give them to us, so we, you know, we keep them. Well, John, I appreciate you playing. I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy to get a keychain. Okay. okay. <laughs> you want to stick around for a little bit so we can get uh, your... Actually, uh, actually, can you... Can you um, yeah, let me, um, let me get your uh, information. You mind hanging out for seven minutes on hold? Yeah, I'll, I'll hold. Okay. okay. Hang uh, tight. Once again, us. John, thanks for playing. Thanks. Okay. And that was that. Yeah, that was tough. Actually, the culture from which the first exorcism was found was uh, ancient Egypt. Really? Yeah. Huh. Apparently, it was a exorcism in the sense, in the traditional sense of a of a prince that was cast, possessed by a force. Uh, they they referred to it as uh, Set. You know, Set the being the evil. You know, I should I should have thought about mythology. that. I should have thought about that. Yeah. Samaria or something. I should. Yeah, actually, Babylon was one of the other places in. that. Uh, yeah. Okay. What, what's the other ones? Uh, apparently, the three materials and um, water, sometimes oil, is used, and then salt. Salt. Yeah. Huh. I would imagine salt may be maybe. Maybe I've just seen they, The Exorcist way too many times. I don't know. <laughs> maybe the uh, Orthodoxy may use salt. I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. That was interesting though. Beelzebub translates to Lord of the Flies. Really? Kind of yeah. like the old Aerosmith song from the 70s. Or the book. Lord of your thighs. Oh, that's... <laughs> sorry, that was... <laughs> wow. Uh, flies, thighs, you know, 
Scott, my family's listening. Oh, yes. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> it's an old Aerosmith We're song, just man. Look it up, man. It's, it's in the uh, 70s. Yeah, I know. It's, it's Scott. Uh, you know, you just you know, have those, to be, be with them. 1970s people. And, of course, <laughs> you know, Legion. Legion, yeah, I got that. I always wanted to say it was Minion for some no, reason. No, it's Legion. Minion there's a book, sounds There's more actually sinister. a book, a uh, fiction book, um, that uh, Blatty wrote after he wrote The Exorcist. It's called Legion. Uh, it's what they based Exorcist 3 on. Oh, you know? okay. Well, that's it. Um, <laughs> let's uh, move on to our uh, our guest for next week. Upcoming guest? Yeah, let's um, do that. Let's see. Uh, hang on. Cora's in the chat room. She said that she could get his address, so John doesn't have to hold on. John, I know you can still hear us, so if you can just give that to Cora in the chat room. Cora. Uh, let me put it. John back on real quick. John, you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you're still on air with us. Hey, listen, Cora is just going to take yeah. down your info in the chat room, and uh, we'll we'll see you next week. Okay, I'll do that now. Okay, thanks a lot, Thank buddy. Guys. Take care. Okay, thanks, John. Yep. All right. Wow, we'll keep up some music, buddy. All right, um, but you've got it, man. Uh, just get with the sample. All song. right. Yeah. Nothing like Quincy Jones. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Jones. I agree. Um, 